Um, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. And I would like to ask you to put those questions in the chat, um, which you will find um, on the bottom of the Zoom window. And if, if, if you do that, I can collate all of those questions and ask them on your behalf in the end. Um, now, I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker for today, which is Dr. Elizabeth Tristein. She is a fellow and the director of clinical studies at Lucy Cavendish College. And she works at the School of Clinical Medicine and is responsible for the delivery of the professional responsibilities curriculum. Um, Dr. Fistain is a member of the first tier tri uh, tribunal and has worked as a consultant psychiatrist in the Cambridge, Cam uh, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. And she sits on the Psychology Research Eth uh, Ethics Committee and um, approved clinicians appointment panel for the Midlands and East of England and is an associate at the Center for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences in the Faculty of Law. So loads of interesting things. And I bet you have already quite a lot of questions. Um, but yeah, we're looking very much forward to the talk, which will be about the practical ethics in the COVID-19 pandemics, which is a topic that touches everybody of us and um, the way we're currently living our life and how that the decisions on that are made on a maybe higher level um, than, than just, just our, our own just the population level. And I'm very, very much looking forward to your talk. Um, welcome, Dr. Fistein. Um, the stage is yours. Thank you ever so much, Ava. And I will just start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you are able to see that first slide. Um, it's still in presentation mode. Still in presentation mm -hmm. mode. So I shall swap displays. And how does yes, that look? Perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. Lovely. Oh, that's actually better for me too. So that works really well. So that's me. Thanks for the introduction. My email's there if anyone um, wants to get in touch after the talk. Um, and I'm just going to tell you the story of some work I've been doing alongside a number of really amazing colleagues for almost a year now. So the story starts back in March last year. And as you've just heard, what was I doing? I was spending a lot of time teaching medical ethics to medical students and junior doctors. I was sitting on mental health tribunal panels all over the east of England. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist by training and that's what I do for my patient facing work. And for a couple of months, I'd been working with colleagues at the Royal Papworth Hospital to set up an ethics committee. Um, my colleague, um, Terza Peters, had been calling me a couple of times over the years saying we've got this really tricky problem Elizabeth how can you give us a framework to think through how we approach this and Terza and I had been invited by Stephen Webb at Papworth to go and deliver some training and then we were all working together to set up kind of a formal process for having a discussion to, for more of a, a joint team approach to some of their most difficult ethical problems that they face at the hospital. The other thing I did in March was um, joined Lucy Cavendish and about a week after I, I came and, and was elected to fellowship, um, we all went into lockdown. Um, and kind of coinciding with this, from February to March, I was getting these increasingly frantic calls um, from former elective student of mine who lives in northern Italy about everything that was going on there with COVID-19. Colleagues that I knew in our local hospitals were getting, getting in contact saying, Elizabeth, do you know about ethics? We think we've got some big decisions coming down the line. How will we know we're doing the right thing? And then we went into lockdown and then the story I'm going to tell you this evening unfolded. But I just want to fast forward through to now January 21 and think about what's changed and actually what hasn't changed. I'm still teaching medical ethics to medical students and foundation doctors and increasingly other doctors as well because people have got very interested in medical ethics this year for some strange reason um, but I'm doing it online over Zoom so hopefully 
um, you're getting the benefit of me being reasonably used to Zoom now this evening. I'm still sitting on mental health tribunal panels, but not just in the east of England, all over the country, because they're being done online. Um, so I'm spending a lot less time in my car, which is nice. And I'm getting to meet colleagues from all over the country and see how they practice, which is really interesting. And I'm getting to see other centres that I would never have seen had this not been happening. And I now find myself as a member of not one, but two clinical ethics committees or clinical ethics advisory groups, one at West Suffolk Hospital, um, which is obviously one of the important hospitals in our region. It's, it's uh, a, a, a very much a general hospital um, serving the community in Bury St Edmunds and around, and another committee at Royal Papworth, which is very much a, a specialist centre um, serving people from all over the region. Um, I've experienced having a relative in hospital, luckily not with COVID-19, but I, I, I've, I've known from personal experience now what it's like as, as a carer not being able to go in, having maybe difficult communication with the hospital. And we find ourselves back in lockdown. We find ourselves facing down a second wave, which is in many ways even more challenging than the first wave, but hopeful about a vaccine and reflecting on what I've learned over the course of the last almost one year. And I will share some of that with you this evening. So when this all started back in March, these are the questions we were kind of anxiously asking ourselves. Are we going to run out of ventilators? We'd seen the pictures from Italy. We, we, we'd heard the concerns from Italy. Are we going to have to ration access to intensive care or, or to ventilators? Will we be able to justify our decisions? Um, if our teams are going to have to make some very difficult rationing decisions that maybe are at odds with their own professional values, will, will that cause moral distress? Will that cause moral injury? I'll say a bit more about what that is. How are we going to cope? And one thing that I've, I thought was very important and a number of colleagues thought so too, is how we will cope is by supporting each other. So um, very near the start of the pandemic, I went to a very interesting online lecture from Neil Greenberg, who was actually one of the medics um, who was giving input to the London Nightingale Hospital. He was, he was doing mental health input for them. And as he says here, the only way we're going to get some sense of meaning out of this is to have discussions with others who are in a similar situation and who can help them to come to some sort of understanding that in these really challenging or difficult circumstances, they did their best. And that's something I, that struck home for me. And I, I've, I've tried to bear it in mind as we've gone through the past year. So talking to colleagues in our local hospitals, we were thinking about what we needed to put in place. And what we decided together was we needed a clear framework that we would be able to use in order to make difficult decisions that arose. And we needed a clear and transparent process for following that framework so that we could tell the people who were affected by advice that we gave or decisions that we made why we'd made the decision and how and even if maybe they didn't like the advice we were giving they could see where it was coming from and weigh up whether or not they were going to accept it so a lot of the time when we were setting up these groups it wasn't to decide policy ourselves but it was to advise um, executive teams in NHS trusts give them some ethical input into their decision making when they were um, revising policy to cope with the pandemic and we decided we needed a diverse team of people to um, put that process into action. Um, by having kind of a diverse range of views and experiences feeding into the process, we hoped that we would minimize the risk of various biases affecting our process. And we hoped that we would be able to reflect a range of opinions that were important. 
And also by putting these teams together, we had the opportunity to give each other mutual support through what we all accepted could potentially be a difficult process. But I have to say, it was actually really nice to be able to offer something that people wanted during this process. I had spent many years studying medical ethics, teaching it as an academic subject, talking about it. I felt sometimes a bit at a degree or two removed from reality. And here we were actually putting, putting the theory into practice and in a way that we hope people were going to find quite useful. So, the first thing we had to do was choose a framework and develop a process. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the kind of decisions that we actually found ourselves needing to make, which were a little bit different to the decisions that we thought we were going to need to make. So looking for a framework, we needed something that was simple enough for people to be able to pick up quite easily and apply but also complex enough to take account of the complexity of these decisions that were being made and ensure that we were covering everything that we ought to be taking into account when we were making decisions to offer advice. And my colleague Helly, Helen Manson, who um, is currently an occupational health physician at Addenbrooke's actually, but at the time she developed this framework was the lead for ethics and law at the medical school at Dundee, um, had produced what I have found a very useful framework and I've used it for several years now in teaching ethics and law to medical students. So this is the idea of a core values framework, um, which says there are, there are four areas that it's really important that we take into account when we're trying to make a decision about an ethical issue in clinical practice. So C sounds, stands for codes of professional conduct. So healthcare professionals are regulated by bodies such as the General Medical Council, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and they all have sets of rules and codes that people who are registered with those bodies are expected to adhere to. So that's the C O in core values is R, which stands for regulations, which we're talking about law and policy. The E stands for ethical principles. Um, and rather than going kind of completely back to basics to um, foundational schools of thought in medical ethics, what we adopt here is what's sometimes called the Georgetown mantra of um, four core principles, which people have argued are common to a number of schools of thought in ethics, beneficence or the duty of a doctor to do good and to help where they can, non-maleficence or the duty of a doctor to first do no harm, of avoid causing harm wherever possible, um, the principle of justice or perhaps the right of patients to be treated equitably in relation to others, perhaps treated equally or perhaps treated differently where different needs justify different treatment and the principle of respect for autonomy or the right of patients to have their own choices, preferences and values honoured in medical decision making. And also Helen adds into that the principle of utility or the idea that um, we should try to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And in fact, in a pandemic situation where we're making decisions sometimes for a whole population rather than for an individual patient and we decided together, an overall goal was to try to get through this um, helping as many people as possible, saving as many lives as possible and causing the least harm that we could both to our patients and to ourselves and our colleagues. And then the fourth kind of compass point in this framework is the idea of values. What's important to the people who are going to be affected by these decisions? And how can we make sure we honour those values appropriately and balance them? Because it probably won't have escaped your notice that these four points 
may come into conflict with each other or even within them the some of the principles may come into conflict with each other the values of different people who may be affected by a decision may be different there may be conflict there so we needed to come up with a process for considering all of these things and being able to use it to make a decision and it had to be a process that our committee members who perhaps haven't spent many years studying medical ethics could use, could learn and could feel confident applying um, to quite a fast rate of decision making. Certainly early on in the pandemic, there were lots of decisions to be made. So medics like algorithms, they like things in stages. So what I did with, with Helen's permission, I adapted her framework into a, a nice ABC process, which kind of um, echoed the ABC that we use in resuscitation, airway, breathing and circulation. So stage A is all about acquiring information and assessing it. So making sure people have the facts or as many facts as were available on which to base our information so we could be evidence-based as much as possible, that we understood the values of the people who were going to be affected by the decision as well, and also encourage people at this stage to check in with themselves um, and be explicit about what their own gut reaction to the case is, partly because that often reveals very useful ethical and moral intuitions from people with a lot of rel relevant experience in decision making but also it can help to reveal to you if you've got unconscious biases that are maybe affecting your decision making and it helps to be explicit about it you're less likely to be um led astray by perhaps your biases if you state them at the open and then the people you're working with can challenge them so note what your initial reaction is but be willing to change your mind then stage B is our balancing stage, which is where most of the work of the committee was taking place. Although I have to say in stage A, um, our committee at West Suffolk had invaluable input from the trust librarian who um, did sterling work going sometimes in real time during meetings, running off and searching the evidence and collating evidence for us. So we were making our decisions best based on the best possible information that we could acquire. So back to stage B, we had to think about those four areas that I've already outlined for you and use those in discussion together in order to generate a plan of action. And once we had that, we went to stage C, which is our checking and criticism stage. So um, we played devil's advocate with ourselves in stage C. We, we, we thought about well, what are maybe the criticisms that someone could make of what we're proposing and are we happy that we can answer those criticisms? What are the potential costs of this decision? And not just financial costs, emotional costs, opportunity costs, are they acceptable? And the other C here is consistency. Once we'd started generating a few decisions, we could say is what we're saying today consistent in terms of principles with what we've been saying earlier. So those are our three ABC stages that we've, we follow in our committees. I just want to say a little bit more about one part of that process, which I, I think is quite interesting. So this is this is the kind of the academic part of the talk rather than the practical part. And that's just talking about the values quadrant of the core values. Um, because personally, I found this a really helpful area to think about. It's really helps me to clarify my thinking when I'm, I'm facing clinical ethical problems in practice. And the one area of philosophy that has really helped me is understanding this, the fact value distinction and, and being able to spot when we're talking about facts and when we're talking about values. So statements of fact, these are statements that are based on data. They're verifiable, um, often by conducting um, trials. So I could say of a treatment, there's a 10% chance of serious side effects. That's a statement of fact. And you can go and check that by running an experiment yourself or by going and looking at the evidence that's out there, running a um, 
running a systematic review of the literature. But we're also dealing with value statements which are based on opinions and beliefs and these are things about which reasonable people may reasonably differ. So for my treatment for which there's a 10% chance of serious side effects I could say I believe the benefits outweigh the risks and that may well be true for me but for another person it may not be true and that depends on what the meaning of those benefits and what those meanings of those risks are for that individual person. So to give an example, um, eye surgery is a good example, I think. So there could be a procedure that you would have done on your eye that carried a tiny risk of a very serious side effect, potentially um, sight loss in that eye. But for the most part, this could be a procedure which um, improved vision considerably, so improved functionality, maybe reduced pain or discomfort. So for many people, those benefits might outweigh the risks, which is tiny, but if it happens, it's significant. But for someone who's already lost sight in their other eye, that tiny risk becomes so much more significant. And for that person, the benefits may not outweigh the risks. Or the other situation that I like to talk about is, this comes from my own area of practice, which is psychiatry, um, using a treatment like lithium, which is a evidence-based, often very effective treatment in conditions like bipolar affective disorder. So it can protect people against a relapse, which could have a very disruptive and destructive effect in their life, um, you know, potentially life-threatening relapse or, or relapse that could land somebody in hospital. Um, and there, But there are a number of side effects of lithium and one of those potential side effects is the development of a fine motor tremor. For a lot of people, for myself included, if I had bipolar affective disorder, I think personally I would say the risk of developing a fine motor tremor would um, be outweighed by the benefit of a massive reduction in the risk of relapse. However, if I were a fine artist and my fine motor control really went to the heart of who I was as a person and what made life worthwhile for me, I might evaluate that really quite differently and I might say no, this is not a treatment for me. So this understanding of the fat value distinction is what lies behind the concept of values-based medicine, which was developed by Bill Fulford, who's an Oxford-based um, philosopher and physician, in fact, he's a psychiatrist. Um, and he, what, what, he, he's developed this in contrast with evidence-based medicine. So evidence-based medicine is a, res a response to the growing complexity of relevant facts. There's so many options out there. We need to know which ones work and which ones don't work, which ones are likely to be effective for the patient sitting in front of us so that we can advise them accordingly. Values-based medicine is a response to the growing complexity of the relevant values. I'll explain in a moment why that complexity is growing and it's described as the theory and practice of effective healthcare decision making for situations in which legitimately different and hence potentially conflicting value perspectives are in play and I can tell you we discovered legitimately different and often conflicting value perspectives very much in play when we were trying to make decisions um, about some of the issues that were coming up as we face the pandemic down. So VBM uses five theory principles, things you need to know about, and five practice principles, things you need to be able to do. And I'll just quickly run you through them. So you've got to bear in mind the two feet principle. All healthcare decisions are based on values as well as facts. They're never just based on the facts. But squeaky wheel principle, we only tend to notice that they're based on values when those values are diverse or conflicting. A lot of the time, everyone's in agreement that, say, pain is a bad thing and we want to minimise it. No one's in disagreement. So we focus on the facts, what's likely to be effective in reducing this pain. 
the science driven principle is kind of a, a, a statement about why values are becoming um, more complex and more diverse. The fact that we have so many more options now, um, we're more often faced with the question, we can do it, but should we do it? And for example, at Papworth, it's one of the national centres for ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So for, for any non-medics in the audience, the way I like to think of this is, is it's a little bit like as dialysis is for kidneys, ECMO is for your lungs. So a patient for dialysis whose, whose kidneys aren't functioning, you run their blood out of their body through this machine and it does the kidneys job of cleaning the blood and then the blood's sent back into the body. And you can do that a few times a week. For someone whose lungs have stopped functioning, an ECMO machine, you run their blood out of their body through this machine that um, takes out the carbon dioxide and puts in the oxygen and then it goes back into the body. But obviously that needs to be done continuously until treatment can be found, which fixes the patient's lungs so they can do that job for themselves. So unlike dialysis, which you could be on long term, this is this is a short term supportive measure to keep people alive while we try to fix their lungs. But it's it's it brings up all sorts of questions. Who should have the ECMO? Who should go on it? Um, and if it's not working, at what time do you stop it? Very difficult decisions. So the patient perspective in VM, the fourth theory principle, contrasts is saying just as in evidence-based medicine, the first call is for objective information from scientific studies. In values-based medicine, the first call is for the perspective of the patient. And the multi-perspective principle says that conflict should be resolved by following the correct process, not focusing on trying to work out what's the right outcome. So if you have a process and you follow it, you may arrive at an outcome that doesn't feel terribly comfortable, but often that is because none of the alternatives feel terribly comfortable either. There's no one easy answer to this, but you can feel confident that you can justify what you've done because you've gone through the correct process. And in VBM, the process is all about finding a balance between legitimately different value perspectives. And that's often what we were trying to do in our ethics group meetings. So in practice, how you do VBM you recognise value blindness. So problems often arise in practice, not so much because there are conflicts of values, but because we don't see that there are conflicts of values and because we haven't noticed them, we can't talk about them and try to resolve them. So you need to look out for statements of value and be able to distinguish them from statements of fact. Then the values myopia principle, which is saying we can be a bit short sighted when it comes to our values. We tend to assume that what's in front of our nose is what's in front of everybody else's nose. Other people's values are the same as our own. So the next principle is look out for differences in values. Ask people. The space of values. So once you've um, identify that there is a difference in values. It's about understanding what that difference is, both in terms of quality and in terms of quantity. Then the how it's done principle is to try and find a position of mutual understanding and respect. Um, that's done through using communication skills to understand where everybody's coming from um, and particularly exploring the values of the patient and other people who are going to be affected by the decision. And finally, the who decides principle is that the final decision rests with the people who will be affected by it. Patients, carers and the professionals who have to put the plan into action. So we didn't want to have kind of a shadowy ethics committee that made decisions on high and then enforced them on people. We were providing advice um, saying we've thought through this problem from an ethical perspective. Here's what we suggest. Does that feel like something that you want to put in action? But I temper that a little bit because we didn't want 
individual clinicians to feel that every decision about their patients was on their shoulders. And also we wanted some consistency within the organization. So whether or not you got a particular treatment wasn't a matter of luck based on which clinician was on duty that day. So we did have to have some degree of consistency and policy, which slightly went against the who decides principle. And that was a bit of tension that we found um, in our work. So in practice, what we found, thankfully, thus far, I've never been in a meeting where they've said we, we we're out of ventilators, we're going to have to decide who gets the next ventilator. I think that is because of a lot of incredible hard work by people in hospitals, a lot of flexing, um, a lot of reduction of non-essential work. And obviously we realise that it's going to be kind of facing all the backlog that we know we're going to have to deal with once this crisis is over. And that is a source of anxiety. But we never had to make those really hard decisions that we were very frightened that we might have to make. I, we're not out of the woods yet, but I'm hopeful that we, we're going to get through without getting to that really desperate situation. But we did have some very difficult decisions that we had to consider. And I've just put some examples here just to share with you um, the sort of things that we had to use our core values framework to work through. So early on, um, who can deliver palliative care and who should deliver it. So we were thinking about people who were out in the community with a terminal illness who were approaching the end of life but maybe not exactly at the end of life and we knew that at the end of life they might need significant medication for symptom control and we didn't want a situation where those people couldn't get that medication because they, they couldn't get into their GP surgery or their doctors had been redeployed and were looking after people with COVID. So could we use advanced care planning to make sure people had um, just in case medication, so had medication for symptom control at home and instructions on how to use it if it was needed? And then in our committee, some of the lay members were saying, but doesn't that feel very risky? Maybe you're giving people medication that they might decide to use not for symptom control, but um, to for effectively assisted dying, to take the medication to end their life earlier. And what's your legal responsibilities there? And it was it was fortunate that we could have input then from other perspectives about um, so people who were palliative care experts and explaining that this is actually considered to be good practice and people are advised carefully about when they should use that medication so that was a that was an interesting discussion and we decided we wanted to press forward with trying to make sure people had just in case medication on hand so they didn't have to worry about whether they'd be able to get good symptom control if their doctors were distracted who can make a do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation decision and who should make it? So at the moment, that's a decision in hospitals that's made in conjunction with the patient, but generally by medical personnel. And we were aware that we had a number of very experienced staff members in hospital who probably did have all the knowledge and skills to be making those decisions with patients. But at that point in time, the policy didn't allow them to make it. So we're talking about very senior um, nursing staff and allied health professional staff. And in fact, they may be in a better position to be going through that process than a very junior doctor. So we made a decision that we would advise a change in policy to allow certain very senior nursing staff and allied health professionals to make and record those decisions. Should we stop hospital visits? And if we did, should there be exceptions? So this was, I think, the first example of a problem that came up time and time again, which was about, as I said at the bottom there, balancing individual needs and wishes against protecting the wider public by controlling the spread of infection. Um, so we were needing to ask people to make certain sacrifices for the greater good to prevent the spread of infection and it was difficult to ask people because kind of our professional values are about being patient-centered um, and sometimes we were operating with incomplete evidence early on we didn't really know 
what the risk of asymptomatic transmission was. Um, we didn't really know what the rate of people picking up this infection in hospital was. And we were trying to make a decision about whether we should allow visits to continue in the face of a great deal of uncertainty. Um, so we're making this decision at West Suffolk and we were quite heartened that we ended up at a position that's quite similar to other hospitals in the area of the general rule at the time was we were stopping visits but we accepted that there were some people whose needs were greater um, so children um, people for example people with dementia or people with intellectual disabilities who, who had a need for the support of a carer who knew them well um, they, they, those people's care would really be damaged if they didn't have someone with them um, people at the very end of life, um, women in, in labour who needed the support of a birth partner and in fact their labour was likely to be extended if they didn't have the support of a birth partner. So we made exceptions um, in those areas to the general rule and that leads on to one that we really struggled with, should we continue to support home births? It was really difficult. I think this one it, it, it really brought out the, the, the difference in values problem because there were there were there were a split in values within the staff group. The, 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 I think generally in, in midwifery there's a there's a professional value which is really all about um, supporting women's choice and um, enabling them to give birth in the way that feels right for them. Also, we had a strong professional value about protecting our colleagues and not putting our colleagues at unnecessary risk and at the time we were making this decision it was just shortly after a midwife in Harlow had um, contracted COVID-19 and sadly hadn't survived so I guess it was kind of weighing on my mind on, on, on all of our minds as we were trying to make this decision and also we wanted to I guess alleviate colleagues of um, maybe feeling the need to go above and beyond because that was what their values were um, but put but potentially putting themselves at unnecessary risk and if if people if staff members then contract the illness and are unavailable to work that creates other problems because then you might end up with a shortage of midwives or um, if there's a shortage of ambulances because they're out responding to COVID calls, are you able to manage a home birth as safely as you would be able to if you know you have ambulance backup if something goes wrong? So long discussion over a number of meetings, we on balance arrived at a decision that um, during the height of the pandemic we wouldn't continue to support home births. But I think that was with the knowledge that so stage C of our process that came at a risk because there may be women who would decide to free birth to decide to give birth at home without midwife support um, and does that potentially put them at risk so that it was a difficult decision which did not feel comfortable to make. Um, other decisions about whether to continue to advise um, staff members to attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the community, which we know has quite a low chance of success. And um, community staff members wouldn't necessarily have the PPE that they would need to protect themselves from infection. And we were dealing with uncertain information about whether CPR is an aerosol generating procedure. At the time we were making this decision, there was conflicting information from different professional bodies. Um, so we were grappling with that. And as, as the information about how um, I know BAME is a slightly contested term, it was the term that we were using and that our, our colleagues were using. So that, that, that's the term I'll use today. Um, that, so the really striking um, evidence that it was our BAME colleagues who were appeared to be much more likely to develop serious illness and indeed to die if they contracted COVID-19. So should should we be having different policy for colleagues from different ethnic groups? Should we make that 
feed into decisions about where people worked and what access to PPE they had. And there's kind of initial reaction, um, everyone's equal, we should, we should be treating people equally. It doesn't feel right to treat one group differently to another, but then we work this through and identified, well, if one group has particular needs, then it might be actually imperative to treat that group differently to make sure that those different needs are met and equity is more important than equality. Um, so those are just some examples. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them because I, I want to leave a bit of time for questions, but I'm happy to talk about those other ones um, with you if, if you have questions that you want to ask about those other types of decisions. But if, if it was interesting because what we thought was going to be a lot of um, decisions about rationing and triage and who gets the ventilator. No, we had just a whole range and variety of decisions to make, which were not so much about um, the principle of justice, but they were much more about how do we balance um, diverse values. So my last slide is just kind of reflecting on, I think, what I've learned from the process. Um, it was very comforting to have a clear process and to trust that if we followed the process, we were able to get to a justifiable outcome because often the outcomes we arrived at didn't sit comfortably. But then we knew that any other outcome that we would arrive at would have felt equally uncomfortable. So. Um, we, we, we were able to rely on the process and that was that was very comforting. Um, we were often making decisions in the context of incomplete information. So I, I think it was really important that we explicitly acknowledged what we didn't know. We tried to find out where we could, but um, when we were trying to explain our advice, just to be clear that we were making it on the basis of an incomplete set of information and that the advice might change as the body of knowledge grew. It's really important to help everyone to articulate their values and then to listen to what they say. So we found that we actually had to amend our referral forms for getting people to send us their problems so that we help people to understand what their own values were, understand what was important to them, what they were holding dear, what they really wanted us to take into account as we were talking through their problem. And I think sometimes just working through that process of making a referral enabled people to find their own way through their problem. It's important that the advice that we generated is communicated transparently and the groups I was working with have done some wonderful jobs in um, translating a long and complex discussion into a short and pithy kind of summary for the wider readership. But there is a risk and I think occasionally some of the nuance of that discussion can be lost in translation when you're trying to turn it into something that busy people have time to read and that there's a risk then that um, the careful process of deliberation that the group's gone through isn't apparent in the in the summary advice and then that can lead actually to problems because that can lead to a feeling that there's some shadowy group somewhere who are making decisions on the toss of a coin that are affecting people's lives so um, there's a lot of PR work to do around these kind of organisations and networking and sharing has been I think really important. It's been great to be able to work with two different trusts and to be able to compare and contrast what's going on in those two different trusts and also to work with colleagues who are working with other trusts. So I was on the phone yesterday to, to Zoe Fritz who with Paul Flynn is in the process of setting up a similar um, clinical ethics advisory group for Addenbrooke's and it's, it's really important to be able to share experiences and not reinvent the wheel. So Helen, myself and some of our colleagues on the West Suffolk committee have written up our experiences as a case study just to share it more widely, so share our learning with others. So I put the a link there to um, the, the paper that describes the process that we've been through and um, Last word goes back to Professor Greenberg and 
that actually it's been an absolute privilege to work with the people that I've been working through throughout this crisis. Um, although we've had to make some tough decisions together, it has been um, it's been really comforting to be able to feel that we're making a difference, that we're helping in our own way. And um, I've met some new colleagues who have been absolutely wonderful to work with and it's, it's really brightened my day to go into a meeting with them and work with them online over Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Even though the work we're having to do is difficult, it's been wonderful to work with them and um, that's made getting through lockdown a whole lot easier for me. So I'm going to finish there and um, very happy to answer any questions people might have. Thanks so much. That was really interesting. I think everybody learned a lot. There are indeed a lot of questions, which is great. Um, so maybe we start with those ones that get, can kind of go in one category and actually touch the last bit where you talked about um, the transparency and the communication. And so Car Carolina uh, Kubersha was asking um, for the about the home births. What mm. was the justification? Uh, what's the justification of the decision? Um, well explained to the to the women who wanted to do a home birth. Or is the justification actually aimed at, uh, um, at, at protecting the NHS resources primarily? So, so who's doing the, the communication actually to the patients? That's, that's a, a really good question. I think, I think that was one of the things we found very challenging. So we had an executive board asking us for advice about what we thought their policy should be around home births. And so in, in a, in a, in some way, a client in a way, if you like, was the, the trust exec and we were trying to produce some information aimed at them. But then there's a really important step in communicating the new policy and the reasons behind it to the people who are going to be affected by that policy. Most importantly, women who are pregnant. In that, in that local area. Um, so we did try very hard to work with the trust communications team um, to, to make sure not only the decision, but the reasons behind the decision were communicated. Um, I, it, it was very difficult. And I, 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 I won't say, I, I feel we were always 100% successful there, there was a lot of heartache around that particular decision and it, it it raised it raised a lot of concerns and we, we kept revisiting it because we, we we really grappled with it um i don't think the decision was taken primarily to preserve resources i think a lot of it was there were concerns that we couldn't continue to safely deliver a home birth support service under the circumstances because we didn't feel like we could access emergency backup um, reliably because of what was happening with ambulance times and the the other question was the safety of the midwives because potentially they're having to attend somebody's home for a, a prolonged period of time and really you need two of them there in order to be able to don and doff all their PPE safely. Um, so there, there were risks involved. Um, but we were balancing that. We said, what, what, is the, what, what, what actually is the community prevalence of COVID-19? How likely is it that they would catch COVID-19? And we just didn't know. So that was the other difficulty. We, we were having to kind of balance risks and benefits in the context of really incomplete information. But I think what we were thinking about all along really was the safety of the people concerned, but acknowledging that actually for some people that wasn't the most important thing for them. For some midwives, supporting women's choice almost is more important than safety. And, and um, in terms of long-term well-being, for some women being able to give birth at home is really important. So it was really not a decision we made lightly. 
And you also said that you did re revisit it at some point, or or is there is there a continuous um, revisitation of those decisions? And um, is the the decision about home birth still in place? Is asking um, is this a question from Lisa Hinton? So I, I, what what then developed was was some national guidance then came out about um, when you when you stepped up or stepped down to offering a home birth service and and once that national guidance came out we felt we should be using that to make our step up and step down decisions because then that would be we felt consistent and fair because other people in other centres would be getting a similar service. So the, 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 the tough times often were when we were having to make decisions about situations where there hadn't been time to generate national guidance. And once it was generated, we felt largely, unless there were very good reasons for saying there was something different about our local centre that meant we felt it shouldn't apply, we would abide by national guidance. Thank you. And then there's a question. It's, it's kind of a, a topic more mm. from Derek Prater and um, Alia, which is kind of hinting at the same thing, I think, or questioning the same thing. Is with, when you have a conflict situation, either within the committee, uh, finding a consensus position, or um, a conflict between the treating cl clinician, the family, or the patient. Um, yeah, so so the practitioners and patients, or within this community, or within mm. the committee, what, how how do you approach those those conflicts and try to solve them? That's a really great question, and I I think this is this is the place where values based medicine can be really really useful because once we drill down into the reasons behind the conflict we often had the beginnings of a, of a consensus or, or a, a compromise that everybody could live with. So um, once we understood kind of the value position that lay behind someone's position on a particular point or, or more specific point, we, we could look at whether there were any overlaps or, or, or shared values between the people who disagreed that we could use as the basis for moving forward and finding a good position to move forward. I, just, I feel like that's a very abstract answer to a specific question, <laughs> but it was it's often we, we found that that was the case. And certainly within the committee, I mean, it may be that we were just indulging in, in groupthink. That is a risk. But I, I think often when we explored our own value positions, we were able to see why we thought what we thought and, and find a way to come together. So actually, there is a next question from Jody R, which is um, kind of connected to that, which is if you have diff different clinical ethics advisory groups, um, how do that the advice translate to policy changes or also do different hospitals have different advisory groups and can they differ in their conclusions? And um, how do you try to align and, and basically get the consistency yeah. across different hospitals as well? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, a lot of well, yeah, a lot of hospitals over the last year have been setting up their own clinical ethics advisory groups because <laughs> suddenly they've had decisions to make about situations that no one who developed national guidance had thought through yet, or they thought through on very general terms. So there was some very general advice around managing, say, pandemic flu, but then it was difficult to apply that. Um, to the specific problems that people were facing locally. So while we were, had that kind of hiatus, then the individual committees were coming in and helping hospitals to develop their own local policy. And then as the national guidance was coming through, mostly hospitals were adopting that. But for example, at the moment at Papworth, we're just reviewing some of the national guidance just to check that we think it is applicable for our own particular circumstances at, at Papworth, both the region that we work in and the, the specialist work that's undertaken there, or are there good reasons for saying we should slightly flex that guidance to take into account of our particular circumstances? So that's kind of my answer to the relationship between local hospital ethics committees and bodies that are producing guidance on a regional or on a national basis. Thank you very much. That sounds 
There is, is there <laughs> people who maybe, maybe so. okay, cool. Then there is, um, there are two questions which actually on the first look don't have too much overlap, but but they are, they are, they are touching this, this area where you said it's uh, equally or equit equity or equal equality yeah, um, yeah where people maybe need different care or or you know it's a bit complicated in the situation so mm -hmm. one is from nick uh, who says that there were reports that there were working age disabled and chronically ill, Ill people were having uh, do not resuscitate order and um they were also given less priority ventil for ventilators based on the fragility uh, scale which was designed for elderly people and then people have been really really ter uh, terrified of ending up in the hospital and so so yeah. how how is that uh, solved and how is the treatment different for people because it's a different yeah. risk group and yeah. um, a similar issue which is um, exactly not, not exactly the same thing but also a group that you might be were thinking about treating in a different way because they're more in danger it was this BAME, BAME issue mm -hmm. where uh, Alison was asking, how did you solve, uh, no, not Sonia, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Sonia Clark is asking it. How did you resolve that? Um, because those communities are more affected by COVID. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those are two, I, I, they're two great questions. So I'll take, I'll take them sort of one at a time. That the, the issue about um, people with long-standing disabilities um, and their access to treatment is something I personally feel very strongly about um, and we we discussed it very early on because actually there are a number of people um, in, on the committee who also feel very strongly in, in the same way I do about it in that it was very important that we avoided unjustified discrimination so we decided we had to be very careful when focusing treatment, particularly if, if we ever got to the point of having to prioritise and, and triage um, on potential to benefit from the treatment. And by that, we meant potential to survive rather than um, any judgment about the quality of the life that we were preserving. There's finesse to that, but... Um, Clinical frailty scores are kind of, they're in some ways for some people, they might be a very good measure of your potential to benefit from intensive care. Um, and for other people, they might not be such a good measure. So if people are developing frailty as they get older and they, they're able to do less and less, that's sort of a, an indicator perhaps of an underlying physical state, which, is closely connected with ability to survive and benefit from intensive therapy. So it, it, I would say we, we shouldn't be putting people through very invasive um, treatment, which come, which, you know, can be associated with delirium, distressing, potentially painful experiences if they're not going to survive and come out the other end. Intensive care is care, it's not a treatment. On the other hand, there are people who, if you look on the face of it on a critic critical frailty score, may be unable to do certain things, but for them that's not an indicator of their underlying physiological state. It, it's, it's an indicator of a, of a long-term disability that they have lived with, that they're used to living with, and they live a life that is of great value to them. And also, they perhaps are more likely to be able to survive um, a period in, in ITU and come out and live the life that they were living beforehand. Um, so actually um, some national disability advocacy groups got involved in that discussion and had that, I think, nuance reflected then in the guidelines about access to, to ITU and, and how things like clinic clinical frailty score were actually used in making those decisions and I think that was done in it was very helpful that they did that but I think it was it was very sad and unfortunate that, that people with disabilities um, feared that their lives would not be valued in the same way as someone who is as I like to say not currently disabled life might be valued so that was that was the the 
the first part and and how we resolved the issue we, we decided actually we made a very clear decision that sometimes it is justifiable to treat people of different ethnicities differently um to avoid someone becoming disadvantaged so to avoid someone with a protected characteristic perhaps a, you know membership of a minority ethnic group being disadvantaged in relation to the majority and if that means making sure they have preferential access to PPE or um, their kind of their risk assessment um, relating to which area of the hospital they can work in at the moment is different then we decided that that was justifiable and we felt very happy taking that decision and and saying yeah th th this is not um this is this is this is not unlawful discrimination this is actually abiding by our legal duty to promote um equality by making sure different needs are responded to Thanks so much. Um, we do have to we do have to wrap up now because <laughs> because we are running out of time. There are unfortunately a few questions we couldn't answer. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe we can collect them and and and, and have an email answer or something. Yeah, like that. I'm very happy. To. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we answered most of them. And thanks so much. I think everybody learned a lot. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. Thank you. I mean, I, I've certainly learned a lot over the last year and I'm continuing to. So it, it's lovely to be able to, to share that with a community of people who are interested. Brilliant. So I hope loads of you uh, attend the next talk as well. <laughs> so we have uh, regular events here and um, yes, yeah, see you next time, I hope. And thanks again. Bye bye. <laughs>